And me, myself, I thought it was rather strange because it's not like they got a call to come to Burger King. We went directly to the Burger King. Mm -hmm. Well, we went to the Burger King and the uh, other state trooper from that side, they met, not, I guess they talked or whatever. And um, I felt it was strange because I, you know, I kept saying to myself, and, and by me being as lost as I was and confused and had never been in anything like this, I kept saying, Lord, show me, Lord, show me, Lord, what is this? Mm -hmm. So it was like maybe a month later, my refrigerator went out. And I called this, this somebody referred me this guy, refrigeration man. He came. He saw my son picture on the wall. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, that little dude got a raw, a raw deal. And I said, what you mean? He said, you know, they had orders to kill him that night. Wow. So when you all pulled into the, after the police came in to pick him up, they had no idea you were going to ride with them. They, they had no idea that I was going to be nowhere in this picture. Mm -hmm. Did, NOPD knew more about my son than I knew. Mm -hmm. They knew what they were doing. They didn't know I was going to be in the plan. Mm -hmm. So see, I was the, I, although I was his mother, I was the part that came in they hadn't figured out. They figured out parts, but they didn't figure that part out. Mm -hmm. So when the guy said that, I was like, wow. He came back to my remembrance while we stopped. At the same old time, I was dating this guy, Lawrence Fall, at the time. Mm -hmm. His brother-in-law was Alphonse. He worked detail. He sent the same message back to tell me they had orders to kill Rogers that night. Wow. And why do you think they wanted to kill him? I couldn't tell Before you. they got any information or anything I, from him. I'm going to be honest. I really don't know why they want Rogers as bad as they want Rogers. I don't know why they had the plans they had. And this is, but I say that was the plans. I don't know why. But during the time of the trial, when I was going to Tulane and Broad, um, what is this? Mr. Lane, he had wrote up a paper mm -hmm. about, you know, uh, different things that I had told him that Adam Frank, that uh, uh, Riley Williams was dating Antoinette at the time. Mm -hmm. And she had supposed to conceive a child at the same time that his wife conceived a child. Mm -hmm. And I had gave all this information. So they had other policemen at the courthouse and they was reading these papers and they were mad. They were mad, and they were mad, they was mad, and they told me I better watch myself. Wow. The police told you that? Yeah, I better watch myself. Now, with Antoinette Franks, she, of course, was a police officer with um, New Orleans Police Department. She was rejected about two or three times from the department because she could never pass the psychological exam. But she was able to bypass what their um, psych doctor said she went outside of that and somehow fought it and they let her in or something. She went and got an evaluation from her own personal psych doctor, which is weird. You know, the deviating from their policies, that, that was kind of weird to, to begin with. You know, I've never known a police department to do that. But she was able to deviate from their psych doctor, go get a psych doctor of her own, bring those results back and they let her in. and. Um, from my understanding, they, she had um, misconduct on the department from from the the very start. Now, did you ever have the opportunity to meet her? I met I met Antoinette uh, one time in November. Yeah, it was November. Rogers was a dope dealer, mm -hmm. and it was times when Antoinette came to Rogers rescue and the reason I know this is because when she came to my house, Rogers had got shot. Mm -hmm. Him and his best friend got shot. Uh, his name was Namaya. Namaya died. Mm -hmm. She came to my house and she said she came to warn Rogers that the seventh district was out to get him. Mm -hmm. Now little did I know of anything about Antoinette or Rogers what was going on. I just was standing there because it was my house. Mm -hmm. And she complimented me on how well I raised him, but she didn't like Nehemiah. He was a rude uh, kid, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just like stood there and um, she, you know, she just said she was there to warn him because the 7th District was out to get him. Mm -hmm. So that was she was the first she, time meeting And the 7th District, that was a. Um, um, Which was her. her. <laughs> <laughs> Which was her. Uh-huh. Which was her. Because she worked in the 7th District. Yeah. 
of the New Orleans Police Department because you all are divided up in wards. Am yeah. I right? Right. In wards. Um, and, and how long after that did this a particular thing happen? That happened in November and this still went down in March. Wow, so a few months after. How, how has it been for you trying to get attorneys, uh, trying to get t trying to get your son's information out there? Because as I said, we see a lot of stuff nationally and it's slanted because I was just shocked when I first talked to Rogers um, uh, to hear and, and talk to the, you know, your Mr. Wes and you, and you all produce the facts, you know. Um, so what we've really been hearing in the media, as far as these national shows, it has absolutely been slanted. You know, because I know I tell people all the time, we're actually controlled by the main media because we, that's what we hear. Yes. You know, that's what we hear. But how has it been for you getting this information out? Well, it has been like um, pulling teeth you don't have uh -huh. for me. Um, I have went to every channel. Uh, in New Orleans, four, six, eight, twelve, and each one I would talk with someone, but they would say they would have to speak to their um, producer first, and they would get back. Nobody never would get back with me. Mm -hmm. Wes is the only person who has opened his door and let me speak concerning my son, and let my son speak for himself. And as he said. The facts, stick to the facts. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that I'm saying today, if they want to read it, they can read it themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, um, in, 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 in court, they say Rogers was considered a fall guy. Mm -hmm. The fall guy. In court? Yeah, that's the name they used. He was the fall guy. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know. So if they use this in court, if they said this in court, why hasn't he been released? Because they don't want to release him. You know, they don't want to release him. They, they figure that's, that's they, they, well, whatever reason, Ronnie, Daddy, or Mother, or any of them, you know, want Rogers. I don't know. I really don't know. Like I said, I didn't write this book, but I was put into this book. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a book that I'm going to see to the end. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, even at the trial, uh, we went behind closed chambers. Me, Ronnie, William, Mom, Woody Turk, and Rogers, mm -hmm. and Judge Marulo. And she stated herself, a week before this killing took place, her son told her that Adam Frank threatened to kill him. And Adam Franks is Antoinette, Antoinette Franks' brother. brother. Yes. So he was already threatened by the Antoinette, which is the, she's a former NOPD officer who's now doing time for this, for being involved in this murder. Um, can you, did Adam Franks have any uh, um, uh, resemblance to, to your son? Not that I know of. The first time I ever met Adam Franks was when we went to court this time. I never met Adam Franks. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who Adam was. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the only resemblance, they both black. That's the only resemblance mm -hmm. I can give you. Because black no one could ever even give a description. Different. Nobody no. ever even gave a description, so they don't know who was actually there with Antoinette. The only person that they knew was Antoinette, am I right? Because that came from the victims that survived now. Well, due to the fact that this story has been uh, 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 the media, they knew Adam. I didn't know Adam. Mm -hmm. You didn't know Adam. They knew Adam. Because mm -hmm. when Adam took the trial, when Adam came to, to, to court, which was my first time meeting Adam, Adam stated that he had sat at one Ronnie, Ronnie's, Ronnie's table several times. Mm -hmm. So they knew Adam. Mm -hmm. They knew Adam, and Adam knew them. And they asked uh, Adam when was the last time he uh, spoke with his sister. He said Monday. Mm -hmm. Now, inmates can't even write each other, so how she gets to visit her, her brother? Somebody's paying for that. Mm -hmm. Now, with 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 Antoinette Franks and Ronnie, why why do you think that? Um, the, actually, the robbery that happened that the supposedly happened, no money was even taken, am I right? They don't even talk about the money anymore. Because they said no money was even taken. No money was even taken. And um, so it couldn't have been a robbery because when you rob something, you go in there for some money or something, right? Some they, right? I'm sure they didn't want the rice because it was a Chinese restaurant, right? Correct. <laughs> I don't so, think they wanted the rice. So um, what, what, why do you think that happened? 
from from just from what you found out from the paperwork that you and Ms. Mr. West have, what, what what do you think happened? Why did that happen? Well, from what I this is only my opinion. Being on the outside looking in, I think due to the fact that informants had told my attorney Willie Turk, who's deceased now, that Rodney was under indictment. Mm -hmm. My opinion is. They call Rodney the good guy. That's what people on the street would say. He was the good guy. Uh -huh. So maybe Rodney knew something on these same old police officers who took the field for my son's trial uh -huh. and um, talked on Antoinette's trial. He, I think he, he knew something about them. They, he knew something. And whatever it is, not just Rodney, really, I think Rodney, um, all the police officers of Marulo, Harry Connick, all of them is in this. This is this is a long line of corrupt. Mm -hmm. this and Harry Connick is the district. Was but the, he was. He was. He was. But this the one now is just carrying his torch. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Harry Connick, um, there was some um, um, corruption going on in his office. A and lot. he was there at the time that your son was there because they were actually hiding evidence of things that was going on and people were being convicted because of the evidence that they were hiding. In other words, um, either they didn't they they didn't really care about well they didn't care about justice. They were trying to get a win or they were just trying to um, convict black people, either selling them to the to these private jails or they just wanted a win. You know what I mean? So we know that that happens because they say I guess they think that black people's lives are expendable. Yeah. Well, um, how has it been for you? We're going to bring Mr. West on in the next segment, but I just want to know how has it been for you and, and your family? Uh, it has. It hasn't been easy at all. Um, um, Roger's kids were small at the time when he went to jail, so I used to bring them when they were small. Uh -huh. The um, two boys, they still, you know, visit, you know, they communicate with him a lot. Uh -huh. They, they, they. Uh, they loved their dad, and he loved his kids. He, he loved his kids. Even from behind the bars, it was not one holiday that he would get in touch with uh, Angel Tree uh -huh. and would get people to make sure they had Christmas gifts every year. Uh -huh. And um, they, um, I'd say, it's, for me, it's, it, it's, it's a lonely journey. It uh -huh. really is. It's a lonely journey. but. Uh, what keeps me through all of this is my faith. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know and I believe that uh, the truth shall be prevailed. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it has been a long time, and I, I'm not sure I have a, a, a longer time to go, but I'm not going to give up because uh, I know he's innocent. Mm -hmm. They know he's innocent, but how can a person know the truth and won't tell it? I can't figure that out. I really can't. I can't figure it out. But it, it has been a it has been a, a, a long journey. It has been a long journey for you and his children. Yeah, for his Who kids. Because he was basically they were babies. They were like small uh, babies. Rogers, little Rogers was I think Little Rogers was one at the time. He's twenty. He's twenty two now, and Roderick is twenty, and Rodney is twenty. Wow. Wow. Well, we're going to bring Mr. West on in the next segment, and I just want to say this. With Roger Lacaze's case, it was a very high-profile case. And when I do shows of this nature on this show, it's because I have proof to back up what I say. I know that this is going to be released. We're going to release it here in this area, but we're going to also release it on social media, so I know it's going to be seen by many. Everything that we talk about on this show, we can back up with the paperwork Thanks. and we welcome you to look at it. We welcome you to challenge it because I wouldn't speak about it and I don't go against anything when I feel like there is an injustice. You know, if the person has committed something and, you know, they've committed the crime actually, but this is an injustice against Rogers. There was corruption from the start. As you heard, he said that the gun that was used in this murder was actually released to Antoinette Franks from the judge that presided over the case. Two jurors lied um, because they were in law enforcement. The dispatcher that actually took the call was on his jury. That's unheard of. 
How could that have even happened? And another police officer who was on the case lied about being a police officer who had been a police officer for decades. You know, then you got Mr. Harry Connick, who was the district attorney who is now retired, but his office was known for corruption. His office was, they haven't, it's, it, it's just been found out. I'm sure it was a known, it was a, a quiet unknown, a quiet known, you know how to keep things quiet. But they were known for hiding evidence just so that they could get a win. When is it going to stop? This is happening in New Orleans. Our men aren't expendable. You know, if someone commits a crime, then by all means, I don't care what race they are. They are supposed to, they're supposed to do the time. But it seems that the people that should be doing the crime are actually the people that's, that's, that's on the other side of the law. The people that's supposed to be enforcing the law they're the ones committing the crime. And the only thing I have to say is because I know it's going to be seen in New Orleans, when are we going to speak up and stop this? Our sons are being jailed. Our children are being jailed. Our women are being jailed. And we don't know why. We don't know why. It's, go it's going on and it's been going on this long. It's a slavery system and it has to stop. But we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Ain't no cooking like country cooking. Cooking like country cooking. My name is Homer Fulton. I'm the owner of Country Cooking Soul Food Restaurant, located at 1128 Winchester Road in the heart of Whitehaven. If you want some good down home cooking, come to Country Cooking Soul Food Restaurant because ain't nobody cooking like country cooking. Ain't no cooking like country cooking. Yeah. Giving, sharing, caring, and providing is what the IBEW Johnny Dawson Charitable Foundation is all about. This foundation has been in existence for five years now and to date has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the communities in Memphis and throughout Shelby County. Our foundation is a branch of the IBEW Local 1288 Labor Union. The union that represents the employees of Memphis Light Gas and Water Division. The IBEW Johnny Dawson Charitable Foundation sponsors various Feed the Need campaigns in efforts to care for our seniors, less fortunate individuals, veterans, and children. If you would like to give monthly donations to this foundation, please visit our website at www. JohnnyDawsonFoundation.org or mail your checks to 4000 Clearpool Circle, Memphis, Tennessee 38118. All donations are tax deductible. Remember, we must mimic Jesus by spreading compassion for the less fortunate. I am Rick Thompson, business manager of IBEW Local 1288 Union, well, and I approve this message. Tamara. In this segment, I have Mr. West Johnson on my show. Mr. West has a TV show in New Orleans called The Name of This Our Story, and he also speaks about the injustices that is happening in New Orleans, and he gives fam those families who don't have a platform the opportunity to come on and speak about their story. So thanks for traveling here, Mr. West. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Now, how did you become involved in this case? Well, I knew Alice and Roger before all of this happened. Um, and when it happened, I called Alice and asked her if there was anything that I could do. Mm -hmm. and this was in 95. And since then, I've been devoting as much time as I possibly can to helping her and helping Rogers. Because after reviewing the case, I realized that Roger was being set up. Mm -hmm. He was an innocent person in this scheme that um, the NOPD was perpetrating on not just Rogers, but all black folks. Mm -hmm. um, to give you just a little understanding in, in way of background, the NOPD, New Orleans Police Department, historically, historically had been corrupt. Mm -hmm. Before blacks went on the force, uh, whites used to 
be killed, um, send people that were innocent to jail, sometimes for no reason other than mere entertainment. Mm -hmm. We have found out in later years that NOPD not only is corrupt, but they have been one of the major drug pushers in New Orleans. And that's documented. That is documented. That's documented. We also have found out that <clears throat> in understanding, historically speaking, the criminal justice system is not a system that was prepared, created, or even thought to protect black people. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that's a harsh indictment, but it is an indictment that can be proven merely by looking at the Constitution. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution clearly states, slavery shall be abolished except for punishment of crime. Now what does that mean? First of all, that means that if you're a black person, because the 13th Amendment only covers blacks, mm -hmm. then if you get convicted of a crime, you are then subjugated back into slavery. Via the prison system. Without any possibility of emancipation. I point to this as a reason as to why the police get away with shooting down black people in the streets why police get away with stopping blacks for no reason, for no probable cause, and why police get off for killing blacks because they say, well, I was just doing my job. If you are black in America, you are a suspect of being a slave because more than likely you have been committed of a crime. And because of the color of your skin, you can be stopped to find out if, in fact, you are a ward of the state or you are still a free person. Mm -hmm. So what is happening to Rogers just illustrates, again, what is going on in America and why we as blacks need to be up in arms mm -hmm. about what is going on and happening to blacks. Now, through my research and investigation of the crime. And I want to state that I've used, for the most part, the information, documentation, evidence that the NOPD, the court system, and also his attorneys, Roger's attorney, his recent attorneys who are um, going through the appeal process trying to get him a new trial. Uh -huh. From that, it is obvious that this man is innocent 150%. Uh -huh. I sat through several days, a week and a half or better, of post conviction hearings to get him a new trial. And I've heard witnesses after witnesses come and testify how this system kept Rogers from having a fair trial. Uh -huh. So it is with this that I stand on a very firm ground in saying that he is definitely innocent. Now, you had asked your question about Ronald Williams, and you heard Roger's mother talk about the fact that there was questions about this being a hit or not. Absolutely. It's known that Roger Williams was under federal investigation, mm -hmm. and other law enforcement officers Ronald were, Williams or Rogers? 
Ronald, Ronald, Ronald Williams, 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 Williams was under federal investigation. Okay, you said Rogers. It's I'm Ronald. sorry, Ronald, yes, was under federal investigation and that the police officers were afraid that Ronald was going to talk, mm -hmm. implicate, and consequently indict others, mm -hmm. of the police officers that year. So this was a hit. Mm -hmm. My name is Tamara, host of Real Talk with Tamara, owner of Tamara's Productions Network. I'm proud to say that my network is expanding. We're producing reality shows, TV shows, and just like I produce my own TV talk show, Real Talk with Tamara, and record it, I'm also doing the same with other TV talk shows. So, if you have a TV idea, if you have an idea and you want it on TV, Give me a call. We have a gang of producers over here that would love to help you to get your message out. If you're looking for a studio to record your shows in, look no further. We have a big new studio that we would love to have you at. If you have a business and you would like to advertise on Real Talk with Tamara or on Tamara's Productions Network, give me a call. If you need a commercial, don't worry about that. I have a team of experts that can produce you a professional commercial for your business. As I said, be on the lookout for Tamara's Productions Network. We're on the rise. Rogers called in from Angola State Penitentiary to speak about his case, all the discrepancies in his case, and to kind of get his story out there. Now, I know you all have heard a lot about Rogers Lucas story. His story was, um, it happened back in 1995. Am I right, Rogers? Hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Did your did your case happen back in 1995? That's that's correct. Okay, and it happened. Um, and Antoinette Franks, who was then a New Orleans police officer, she was involved. Am I right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and since then, there have been like numerous shows done on your case, but you've never really had the opportunity to get your story out. Never had the opportunity. Any show that you ever seen, I wasn't any part of that. Okay. So thanks for calling in and being on this show today. You me? Can you hear me? I didn't hear you that clearly at that time, tell me. Okay. I said thanks for calling in and being on the show today. You're very welcome. Okay. Um, now, back in 1995, something happened and you were then jail. Can you tell my audience a little bit about what happened? I just kind of gave them a synopsis. Like I said, there have been many, many shows about what happened with your case, but not, no time have I ever seen you. I have, I've never even seen Antoinette Franks give an interview. Um, we'll get into that later. Of course, this is going to be like a two-part show. Um, so we'll have the opportunity to start from, go from A to Z to speak about all the things that haven't been spoken about because there have been so many twists and turns to this case. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so can you just kind of start with what happened that day in 1995? Yes, um, basically it was just a regular day and, um, you know, me personally, I have never been to the restaurant before that night, and um, you know, at the time I knew I was that, and it was it was you know a time that actually um, before then I was actually drug game, and you know I got a drug game, and and that was like hey you know I can get you a job, and that day she actually got me a job, so she was like I know a good place we can go celebrate, you know what I'm saying? So the whole thing is. This place was somewhere that she used to work at. And so she was like, you know, once I get off, you know, we can go and celebrate this particular restaurant. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I actually went home and laid down and forgot all about it. And then she came to the house. She was like, look, um, damn, you know, you're not gonna stand me up on, I did get your job today. I was like, okay, cool. So we went to the restaurant. She went in first and she went order some drinks. She was like, we're gonna go to the movie. And then we went to the movies, got to the place, she was like, you know, she was acting strange, but back then I didn't, I mean, you know, being 18, really just not really having the focus that I do not, I wasn't aware of what was going on. 
Okay, so what did the police say when they when they pick you up? What happened with that? Well, when it, when it came, um, my, my mom asked me where I was, what the location was, and um, I actually told her, you know, I was very familiar with the police at the time, and I told my mom, well, you know, my, my exact words were, look, mom, I don't trust some people. If you can come with them, and we can talk. And um, so they was like, fine, you know what I'm saying? We just want to talk to you, that's it. And um, I said, could you tell me what it's concerning? They said, well, we just want to talk to you. And um, I gave them the address of where my brother was, and they came over there to the house, and they didn't do any talking. They said, um, hey, put your hands out. We're going to cuff you for our safety and your safety. I'm like, what's going on? And my mom was like, well, just listen to what they have to say, you know what I'm saying? And it was like, what a clothes you had on the night. You know, got the clothes, and um, we rolled to a Burger King where we stood at. This is a call from an attendant at A, Louisiana Department of Correction facility. They drove to a Burger King. Um, establishment where we sat in a parking lot for maybe 10 to 15 minutes and um, from there we ate it. we proceeded over at the interrogation over at the bar. Now was there anything suspicious about when um, they came to pick you up because your mom was in the car with you right your mom rode with you when you all were in that Burger King lot was there anything suspicious about that? And to be honest at that time and moment you know, only thing I'm thinking is why I'm on this police call. So I wasn't thinking about anything else, to be honest, which I'm like, this, like, what's really going on while I'm in this police call? And they kept just saying, look, we're going to talk to you when we go to the station. So I never really thought about, the, you know, anything else that may have been going on or what they had plans to do. Mm -hmm. So when you get to the station, what did they say and how did they act? When I arrived at the police station. Uh huh. When I arrived at the police station, um, actually I passed by two Vietnamese, a, a, a young man and a, and, a, and a female, and um, I walked through, and from there I walked upstairs, and one officer came in and, and we were talking, and I just told him, "Listen, could you please tell me what's going on?" And he was like, well, something took place at a restaurant. Was he at a restaurant tonight? I said, well, he had a, a restaurant tonight. And from there, like, everything got ugly. I kept telling him I wasn't involved. And from there, they got a telephone book, a yellow page telephone book, and started slapping me across the head, in the back of my head, um, in my face. And I'm talking about things just got ugly from there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, at this time, did they tell you that Antoinette, had they already told you that Antoinette Franks was involved? Yes, they did. And they said that she implicated you? Yes, they did. They said that you know what the bitch did, and the bitch said you was with her. Now, <clears throat> after you were arrested, did you have the opportunity to speak with Antoinette? At any time? When I was at the table, um, the very first time before our case got severed. Before our case got severed, we um, actually had a, um, a hearing together. And, um, you know, of course, you know, I, I went off on her and uh, she was like, everything gonna work out for you. You know, everything gonna work out for you. You know what I'm saying? They gonna find out that you have nothing to do with this. Everything gonna work out for you. And she actually wrote me a letter as well. And she wrote me a letter, and I sent the letter to my mom. And she was like, look, I'm sorry for implicating you this here. Everything gonna work out. Well, you had at the bottom, she put the God be your glory. And I gave the letter to my mom, and she gave it to one of my attorneys. From there, the letter came up missing. And this was an attorney way back, um, I think like in 97. Her name was Lane Tripp. Mm -hmm. Now, Rogers, now, just from what we know about the case and just from what we found out about the case, do you think that the police knew that you had nothing to do with this from the very start? I do it one more time. Just from what we know and what we, what we found out, like all the holes that's in your case, all the discrepancies um, that's leading to you not even being involved, do you think that the police knew from the very beginning that you had nothing to do with this? Do you think that they knew 
I'm certain of that. I'm certain that they knew I had nothing to do with it from the very beginning, especially once I was in homicide, because in homicide is where they tested my hands. And from there, when they tested my hands, they kept saying, you're not the shooter, give us the shooter. Like, look, I don't know what y'all talking about. It's like, you're not the shooter, give us the shooter. Then they took my tennis shoes off, and they had this, like, it was like almost a regular ink pen, but without the ink. And then they ran it through the, the you know, the crevices of the shoes, and they put it on a white piece of paper. And he was like, they had too much blood in the restaurant, it's not the shoes you wore tonight. And I'm like, sir, that's the shoes I wore tonight. From there, he slapped me in the face with the tennis shoe. He didn't do the other tennis shoe and bust me in my face with the tennis shoe. So, you know, like, as I said, I didn't have a chance on the side. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, since this has happened, what did you later find out about the gun that was used in the, um, in this homicide? I found out that um, Antoinette had reported the gun stolen from the cottage that she attended. Mm -hmm. But her brother actually got found with the gun in 1998. And the gun, this is like real deep, the gun that was found was actually a gun that was found out by Frank Marullo, who was my presiding judge at the time of the trial. So Antoinette and my judge actually knew each other in some fashion or form. But he never revealed that before I went to trial. So this Even judge that presided, the judge that presided over your trial, the gun that was used in this murder was his? No, it was actually a gun that he signed out to answer that Frank. Oh. Wow. Yeah, his John Hancock is actually on the order that signed out that particular gun to answer that Frank. So you're right, they were connected in some shape or form, so he never should have been presiding over that case. Never. At all. Wow. So, not only that, Rogers, but um, it was something else I was intending to ask you about that. We know that the, oh, your jurors. Tell my audience about that. Excuse me? Your jurors. My jewelry? Uh-huh. That was stolen from the house? Not jewelry. No, not jewelry. The jewelry. The jewelry. The jewelry. Oh, the that jurors. was in your case. Okay, the jewelry. Yes, yes. The jurors actually, um, which we didn't, I didn't know until 2013, but two of the jurors that actually was picked to be jury members, one of them was a dispatcher that actually worked the night that the call came through. So, and that's that she was actually a witness in the case that was actually a juror, which should have never happened. Another one was, uh, he was a police officer for like two decades, and he served on the jury as well. After he was asked, was he a police, or did he know anybody in his family that was police, that he was related to? He said no, he actually lied. And um, in 2015, I, was, I got a reversal on that from an ad hoc judge named Michael Kirby because it was a blatant lie and at that time police was barred from even serving as jurors. So there was a dispatcher and there was a police officer in any other state, anywhere else, that would have been um, means for your, 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 your conviction to be overturned. Because it's, do you think these people were planted in your in your jewelry in your jewelry? Do you think that these people were planted to convict you? Yes, ma'am. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Not only that, you know, and I know that every juror that sits, that's a seated juror, actually, you know, the DA know persistence about them. So, you know, there's no question in my mind that the DA at that time he knew that she was a police and she knew, he knew that she served as a dispatcher, you know, so this was, this, you know, this is just part of what they do in Louisiana, you know, this is like, you know, nobody really is ever held accountable, so they continue to do what they do. Uh-huh. Why do you think that they wanted to convict you? Without a doubt, here's, here's the thing, anytime you have a high profile case, they gonna close it, and it don't matter, any black man will do. They have shown that time and time again. And 
I went to trial. Keep in mind, um, I was framed in 1995. I was indicted in 1995. I was tried and convicted in 1995. I was on that row in less than six months from being framed. Hmm. My trial took one week. My jury, to pick my jury in a capital case took one day. I mean, that shows they had something to hide. Uh -huh. One day to pick a jury for a capital case. One week for a whole trial in a capital case. Well, so, so it seems so it seems like what they were kind of trying to do. Now, the young man that was murdered, we know that that's the victim, and we give condolences to the family and all of that, because we, we, we're never, you know, it's always a sad thing when someone is killed. You know, it's always a sad thing. But the young man that was killed in the case, he was an NOPD officer. Um, you never even knew him. You never even met him, right? You didn't have any problems never with met, him. Never met him in my life. Never met, met him. And, keep, and also, I want this for the record. I have never been convicted of anything before landing on that road. Mm -hmm. Now, the young man that was killed, because I did read that the victim said, one of the, because you know, there were people that, there were, I don't. I can't remember how many people was in the in the actually in the restaurant, but I do know that a couple of them survived. Um, they said that I read that Antoinette Franks walked outside of the restaurant, and when she walked out, they saw her walk to her car, and an NOPD police car pulled up to her, and then pulled off. They said that they tried to say that it was a robbery, but of course, none of the money was taken. Do, do you have any idea of why that crime took place? Do you have any idea? No, ma'am. I, I definitely can't speak on that. But what I can say is that it's been definitely proven that the circumstances of what they're saying happened, a lot of it really is called the subject of recording. That's not true. This is a call from Center at 8, Louisiana, Department of Corrections, facility. If you look at good, it says it, it actually says that other police have to be involved. Mm -hmm. um, you know, since that happened and the brother being found with the contended murder weapon, not only that, since he's been incarcerated, um, a guy named Darren Rippon actually came to my hearing in 2013 and stated that he actually told him that he killed the police in the restaurant. And so that's on record. So Antoinette Frank's brother has admitted to killing the police officer that was in the restaurant. Yes. And do you and you do you feel like that it was cup Antoinette actually implicated you because she was trying to save her brother? No question. No mm -hmm. question. That that's definitely um now it's very clear to me. It's very clear that that was the whole plan. You know, Why do you think that N O P D why do you think that NOPD went along with that? Why do Why do you think they would go along with that instead of getting the getting the actual murder? Why would they go along with Antoinette with that? I think that um, Adam definitely have a lot of dirt on the NOPD, and um, you know, and that's one of the things now that's still being investigated. Uh huh. Because we all know that NOPD has been in trouble for a lot of their corruption around that time they were just flat out murdering people you know the, they actually had to the department of justice had to move in and a lot of other things um the police department was investigated and and i guess they missed the judges chambers i don't know <laughs> i guess they missed that but um now this particular judge he actually signed the murder weapon out that Antoinette Franks used in this murder, there was nothing connecting you to it. Now, later you were taken off of death row. Do you want to talk about that? I definitely want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, was it, I think it's early part of this year, where um, the DA had, um, in, in his petition, stated that he was no longer seeking the death penalty, and he only wanted to focus on the conviction. And um, the thing about that is, is that at no time, and I have definitely expressed in my attorneys, at no time do I feel like that's anywhere just. And um, I actually wrote the DA a letter, you know, 
expressing how I felt about the situation because you have framed me and sent me and sent us me to die for something I didn't do that I had nothing to do with. And now, 21 years later, you say, hey, um, well, we're going to take the death penalty off. You know, like that supposed to leave it anything. My thing is that the AA office definitely know after the hearing that I didn't have anything to do with this. So he's all right with having me serve a life sentence for something I didn't do, but he just can't sleep at night for killing me for something I didn't do. Now the two victims, was it two or three victims that, that actually survived in the restaurant? Was it two people that, we, well you don't know, you weren't there. Actually but, after the investigation we found out there was three survivors and one never came to trial. We actually investigators tracked her down in California. We had the opportunity to put her on the stand in 2013. Well, you can actually pull this up. This is public record where she stated that at no time her other two other people could actually see what was going on from the position they was in inside the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Wow, so they, they never even, they could never even identify you, am I right? You're certainly right. <clears throat> wow. So... After all this time, you see all these shows that's done on your case, why do you think that you've never been interviewed? Number one, I never had the caliber of attorneys that um, and was extremely diligent on media. So, and, and, and another thing is that the reason is so corrupted. You know, I have a great attorney on my case right now, but she's not like rid of the forerunner. Like she has to answer to somebody. You have like, one minute left. The thing is, is like it's very unfortunate for me that I really don't have a platform and my voice really can't be heard. But the fact that matter, a lot of people ask a lot of questions. Here's the thing: look at the evidence. Mm -hmm. The evidence supports what I'm saying. There was no fingerprints of mine, no footprints of mine. All of my clothes are negative, and I have alibi witnesses to where I was at the time of the murder. I mean, and Antoinette's brother was found with the gun. And the brother was found with the gun in 1998. And he's now a certain time for another armed robbery, unrelated. So that's his MO. He has 60 years for another armed robbery that was unrelated to that crime. Mm -hmm. Do you think that? Antoinette, I know you said that she wrote you a letter and you gave it to an attorney and it, you know, you sent it to your mom and it was given to an attorney and then it went Thank missing. Thank you for using Secure it. Goodbye. Okay, we'll continue this conversation. Yeah, I know. Did I ask him everything? Just about. Yeah, you covered quite a bit of it. Okay. Um, yeah, because I mean, he did get to eat got straight to the meat of it. He basically pretty much told everything. I um, I was just going to ask him how it's been for him since he's been locked up for a crime. Um, Terrible. That he yeah, didn't his do kids things of that thing. nature, his you children. Can, you can, she can tell you. Yeah, that's okay. Right. That's right. This has been a Tamara's Productions.